Okay, hi, I thought we'd try something a little bit different today. Uh, and what I thought we'd run do is um, run through the results of the latest Australian election uh, as it pertains to the South Australian Senate. Uh, so it's August 2016, so we just had an election in July. Uh, and uh, in that election, we were electing 12 senators uh, to represent the state, six of them for the next six years and uh, six of them for three years. OK, uh, so Senate elections take a really long time to find out the results. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, that they have to count um, all, all of the candidates. And, and for us, there was, I think, 64 candidates uh, and all the votes for all those candidates and where all the preferences went. OK, so in Australia, when you vote, you don't just vote for one person. You number as many boxes as you feel like numbering, uh, as long as that number is more than six or more than 12. Uh, and then those, um, and then all the possible places where those could have gone needs to be counted, you know. So, so I think they ended up counting uh, 480 times or something like that in this election for this South Australian election to find the final result. So that's why it's now August, and this week we finally got the result for the South Australian election. So in front of us, you see um, a screenshot I have of um, an Excel spreadsheet I made, which is all the votes. Uh, for all the candidates uh, in, in the South Australian Senate election 2016. So you can see um, the winner here, Mr. Simon, Simon Birmingham from the Liberal Party. He's got a 340,624 votes. Uh, and the person with the least votes is Mr. Phil Ingeri from uh, the Palmer United Party, Palmer United Party, who's got five. Okay, so I don't know how big his family is. Um, but he's got five votes. Anyway, uh, so he's, Simon Birmingham has 340,000 votes, but he only needs 81,629 to be elected. Okay, so he needs sort of one thirteenth of the votes of the state in order to get elected. Uh, so he's got way more than he needs. So what we're going to do is redistribute the votes uh, that... Um, redistribute the votes that are over surplus or more than he needs, okay? So the way we're going to do that is we're going to take all the votes for Mr. Birmingham and we're going to redistribute all of them as if they were votes that were only worth 75% of the other votes, okay? Because we've used about 25% of all those votes. Um, we've used about 25% of all those votes to elect Mr. Birmingham, okay? And we've got 75% more of all those votes that are all going to go to other candidates. And for the most part, they go to Corey Bernardi, who's the next Liberal Senator. So you can see here, there's a preference flow. The orange comes off Birmingham and moves to Bernardi. So if we go on, the same thing happens, happens with the ALP. They go off Wong and move to Farrell. Uh, so they now have, yeah, so Petty Wong's been elected and Mr. Farrell still has more than two, so uh, more than more than two quotas, okay? Nick Xenophon is also elected and Sterling Griff gets his preferences. And then we go again with the Liberal Party. So Mr. Bernardi is elected and Rushton's next. Okay, and then Don Farrell's elected and um, Alex Gallagher's still got more than one quota. And um, then Sterling Griff again. Okay, so you can see Xenophon's now got two guys in the Senate. So we've got two each for Liberal, a Labour, and, uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, Liberal, Labour, and the Nick Xenophon Party. So Nick Xenophon is sort of an independent party, uh, but they've been doing pretty well in South Australia lately, so that's not a big surprise. Okay, in fact, it's a bit of a surprise that he only got about 25% of the vote. Um, sorry, you, you know, that he got so, such a little amount. Um, but anyway, it's, that's, you know, yeah, a bit disappointing for them, I think. But hey, what do you do? Anyway, so we've elected six senators, so if the Senate in Australia follows its own rules, because it's not a law, right? They make their own rules in their own session. But hopefully these six should be the six senators that are going to be elected for six years. Okay? And the next six will be the ones that will be in for the shorter term. Now, they could change those rules um, because it's not set in stone, but Senates have repeatedly said since, I don't know, the last time they didn't follow the rules, that this time they totally follow the rules. Okay? And that's how they do it. So those six have been elected. So next in, we have Rushton from from the uh, the Liberal Party and Gallica from the Labor Party. So that's eight seats allocated. Okay. Oh, and Fawcett from the Liberals as well. So that's nine seats allocated. So you can see um, we've we've got nine people over that 80, at that eighty one thousand mark, and there's three seats still up for grads in the South Australian Senate. So you can see. Um, 
McEwen from the ALP has 39,000 votes. Okay, so um, more than halfway or almost halfway to getting that 81,000 that they need. Sarah Hansen-Young from the Greens has almost 65,000 votes, so she's getting pretty close. Uh, and the third Xenophon candidate, uh, Kakoshki Moore, I should really learn her first name, it's Sophia maybe? Anyway, um, I'm going to have to find out. Who will it serve? Spoilers. Um, so she's, she's 20,000 votes away from, from getting appointed, okay? So where are we going to get these votes? And the answer is we're going to um, remove... Uh, the people with the fewest votes first, and we're going to redistribute the preferences for those um, for those candidates. So if all those people that voted for, um, say, the um, uh, One Nation Party, we're going to redistribute their votes and find out who um, who their second choice was or who the third choice or however far it go down it goes until we get 12 senators. Uh, so... You can see those three have got a good chance to pick up these seats. We also have Bob Day and um, and Burgess from the One Nation Party. So Bob Day's in currently. Um, Burgess is new, but One Nation have been really popular, really strong around the country. So they're both sitting at around thirty-one thousand. So they're um they're they're quite a long way behind McEwen for the ALP, but they're definitely in with a chance. Okay, so we're going to move on and remove some other candidates. Okay. Can't really see what's going on here because we've just gone from 80,000 uh, down to the next candidate's got nine. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change this axis. Axis, we'll map the axis, yep. And we're going to bring this way down, let's say. Okay. Yeah, this will, this will, this will give us good, a good view to start with. Maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. Okay, so um, you can see here uh, the next person to go is Cybert um, from the Citizens Electoral Council. Uh, and you can see they got she, uh, nine votes. Now, I know we said before that Flingeri from the Palmer United Party uh, only had five votes, but here he is, he's got 11. How'd that happen? Well, that was uh, preference flows from those candidates that already got elected, right? So if we go back up, looking at this view that we have before, uh, looking at this view, sorry, and we go back through the distribution of preferences from earlier on. You can see as they flow, they don't necessarily flow just to that next candidate on that party ticket. They're going all over the place, okay? So the Liberal ones, they're mostly going to the Liberals. But um, the Labour ones, there's a whole heap of them going over here to the Xenophon party. There's a bunch over here to some independents um, all over the place, okay? And this is Nick Xenophon's preferences. He's also, they're, they're going to parties all over the place, all over the shop, okay? So you can see the Palm United Party is picking up a, a few preferences here, and that's what's putting them ahead of the Citizens Electoral Council. All right, so the first uh, candidate to be eliminated from the count is Mr. Seibert from the Citizens Electoral Council, okay? So that doesn't mean that the Citizens Electoral Council doesn't have a chance, okay, because they have two candidates in the race. So their second candidate is out, but their first candidate is still in. And that's that's going to be sort of the pattern of the next little bit. So we're going to see the second candidates drop off for all the parties. So Flingeri from the PUP is next, and I'm going to be terrible pronunciation, just deal with that. Okay, we've got Darren Hinch's Justice Party had 14 votes, and so most of these votes are going to the first candidate for these parties. Not necessarily, but, but mostly that's what's happening here. Okay, so we can see the Cyclist Party had 25 votes. Next up is Flux. They were the senators that were going to vote on everything uh, online before they actually voted in the Senate. So 28 votes there. Next to go is um, the Voluntary Euthanasia Party with 37, um, Christian Democrats with 51, uh, one of the Independents with 54, and then another one of the Independents as well, 64, Muhammad Ali, I think that is. Okay, then we have the Australian Liberty Alliance, uh, we have the Motoring Enthusiast Party with 76, uh, we have the AUP, what's AUP? What is AUP? Australia United or something? I, I should know that, but I, it's, um, it's probably not that important. Australian Union, mm, sounds like an insurance company. I don't know. Uh, the Mature Australia Party over there with 84 votes. Then we have ASP, who are, that's the Shooters and Fishers Party, 87. And the um, Animal Justice Party with 96. And then we have another one of the independents, Davey, got a square 100 votes, okay, but now he's eliminated from the count as well. 
Then we have the second candidate for the Arts Party, Sanders. Um, another one, uh, so one from the LDP, 109. Christopher Cochrane uh, out again with 112 votes. Um, we have someone from the um, Equality, Australian Equality Alliance, Australian Equality, you know, the Marriage Equality People at 118. Um, the second to last independent waters with 100, 146. Uh, we have the second candidate for One Nation, who got a very respectable 175. Then we have um, the third candidate for the Greens, who actually got outpolled by the fourth candidate. So that's really interesting. Moat uh, got outpolled by Dakota. That's interesting. I've heard of Moat before. They must have run previous elections. Uh, second candidate for Family First, 222 votes. Now, that's, um, that's really interesting. So those 222 votes, 10 of those decided not to issue any further preferences. Okay, so 10 of those exhausted, um, which is really interesting because the second candidate, right, so they, they liked the second candidate on the family first ticket, but they disliked the first candidate on the family first ticket so much they didn't even bother to put a number behind his, um, behind his name. I mean, that's really strange. Uh, we might just, well, let's just pop this up a little bit so we can get a little bit more. I can't really see much there, can we? Let's, maybe we can actually go all the way out to there now. Okay. So we're at about 8,000. So we can see some more smaller numbers. We can sort of see who's coming up next. So I know this isn't um, super interesting just yet because the numbers we're talking about here are so small that they're not making a huge difference in the outcome of the election. They're, they're shuffling around the numbers a little bit, but generally the numbers we're talking about are, um, you know, they're not, they're not a huge deal. Also, one thing that's really notable here is that um, they're going all over the place. Like all of these preferences, very, very few of them are going in places that you might expect. About half of them are going to the first can the first candidates of all these parties, um, and the other half they're going they're going everywhere. Okay, there doesn't seem to be too much of a pattern for most of these parties. So you can see, oh, we find we have the first first candidate. Okay, so the first person who is the lead candidate for their party to be eliminated, uh, and that's Mr. Koslo from the Citizens Electoral Council. So you can see here he's got 522 votes, and they're going to be distributed amongst other parties, presumably other parties that have sort of similar interests to the Citizens Electoral Council. But you'll see some of them went to Animal Justice, some of them went to the Voluntary Euthanasia Party, some of them went to the Independent, who's against asi uh, so for asylum seekers, uh, yeah, they're, they're sort of going no particular place, so it's hard to pick any real patterns here. I mean, it'd be really nice to sort of see these preferences, preference flows going in ways and be able to sort of predict what's going to happen, right? But we're really not seeing any of those sort of patterns here. And that's not really that surprising, because when people are voting for the second candidates of parties before the first candidates, that means they are voting below the line in the Senate. Um, so they're voting for individuals rather than for parties. So we should, now that people are voting for parties, we're getting down to those first candidates, hopefully we'll see a little bit more of a pattern. Not much though, actually, it's really weird, which is another reason it was would have been so hard to count and surprised only took a month. Okay, so next gone is the, the, the fifth candidate for the ALP. Um, yep. And then we have our last independent, Mr. Richards with 653. So he did well, um, very well for an independent, actually, significantly more than any of the others. And you'll see, again, um, of those 653, 30 people decided they didn't want to vote for anyone else. Um, they're just going to let their ballot exhaust, and that's that's really interesting. Okay, um, the fourth candidate for the Xenophon party is out, and the fifth candidate for the ALP. All right, let's do this. Let's go change the scale yet again. And let's let's go back, see if we can get up to that 80,000 again now. 81, yeah, okay. Oh, what, what was that? What's the magic number, guys? Anyone remember? 81,629, okay. So this is this is the magic number. So anyone can get up to the top of this graph. That's that's the election. That's the election point. All right. So um, last candidate from the ALP. You can see almost all their votes are going to the ALP. So that's sort of sensible. Next, we have Flux. They're a bit of a maverick party, so hard to see any real pattern of where their where their votes are going there. Okay, you can see all these when these numbers. You can see little blue, um, little blue ticks here. This is Palmer United Party. 
So some's going to the motoring enthusiasts, some going to One Nation, some are going to um, uh, the Hemp Party. So, you know, the, all of the, the other reasonably major minor parties is where the, the Palmer United Party's votes are going. So that makes a lot of sense. Next, we have um, the sixth candidate for the Liberal Party. So the Liberals are only going to win a maximum of five seats now. In fact, they're going to really struggle to get five. So again, remember, there's three seats still up for grabs, and we have the ALP, the Greens, um, the Xenophon Party, the Liberals potentially, Family First, and One Nation going for those three spots. So uh, three of those are going to go home unhappy. Well, maybe not that unhappy, but yeah. Okay, so Australian Unity or whatever, whoever they actually were. I've got to learn who they were. Yeah, they're gone now and it seems like most of their votes went green. Um, although some went liberal, so they can't really make up their mind. Okay, the cyclists, as expected, they, their votes went green and xenophon. That's that's to be expected. They're a, they're a very green outlook party, but um, if you're voting for the cyclist party, you probably have a bit of an independent streak to you. Okay, um, the Darren Hinch's Justice Party, so they've moved their votes to the to the Animal Justice Party and to One Nation. Um, so that's more a right-wing sort of uh, party with a bit of a basis on um, w immigration policy, let's to put it nicely. Okay, um, the second candidate for the Greens has been eliminated, and you can see most of their votes went to the Greens. Okay, uh, Christian Democrats, most of their votes have gone to Family First. So you can see just here, this is where Family First have finally caught up and just leapfrogged One Nation. Okay, uh, the Voluntary Euthanasia Party have been eliminated and their votes have gone pretty much everywhere. Not really surprising for a single, single issue party. Okay, the Arts Party have gone mostly Green and Xenophon again, um, with some Labour. So that's pretty typical for the Arts Party. Okay, um, Australian Liberty Alliance have gone mostly to One Nation. Okay, so they've they've put One Nation right back up there again with Family First. So those two really fighting off for that, um, and they're 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 both catching the ALP uh, in McEwen. So that's very interesting. Next up, the um, Mature of Australia Party is going, and most of their votes are going to Labor. You can see this uh, exhausted ballots num really creeping up there. So uh, this is the Marriage Equality Party. You can see the Marriage Equality Party had 5,000 votes and of those, a good 300 of them exhausted. So that's, you know, what's that? Almost almost 5%, a little bit more than 5%. No, a little bit less than 5% of their votes. Um, they didn't bother voting for anyone else. Now, for me, I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's a great idea. I think you should vote until there's no one you could possibly bring yourself to vote for, but um, not everyone agrees. So anyway, their votes went went all over the place. Uh, this is the motoring enthusiasts. So again, their votes went everywhere. Uh, Liberal Democrats, you'd expect their votes to go mostly to Family First, and they have, although they've also gone to the Liberals, which you'd expect, and One Nation, and the Xenophon Party, and Labour. Like, this is what I mean. Like, all these people, their votes are going all over the place. It's really hard to predict what's going to happen. It's really hard to sort of see... Um, patterns in what was going to happen in a way that prior to this election, when there was a different preference system in place, um, it was much easier to tell. So it's really a fascinating subject to sort of see how you can't predict anywhere near as much as we once could where all these preferences were going to go. People are directing their own preferences a lot more, and they're not necessarily going to where those parties might want them to, or not not to the extent that, that you might imagine. Okay, now next is the uh, Shooters and Fishers, and their votes, surprisingly, um, oh, I guess not that surprisingly, okay, so they're going to Hemp, um, so that's the Legalised Marijuana Party, they're going to One Nation and Family First. Uh, the Animal Justice Party, their votes are most more, more or less going to the Greens, but there's a good spread there. Then we have uh, MHP, what's MHP? Oh, that's the Hemp Party, okay? So Hemp, you would expect them to go pretty green, and they have, but they've also gone a lot to Xenophon and Labor and Family First and One Nation. The Liberals have mostly missed out there, um, but everyone else has done pretty well out of out of Hemp. You can see uh, Family First are still sitting about a 1,000 more than One Nation, so they've really made up some ground, get just ahead of One Nation. Uh, so it's going to be really close here. Then the Liberals. 
Okay, so 26,000 votes that were going to the Liberals have been distributed amongst everyone, and you can see it's put, most of those votes went to Xenophon and to the Family First Party, okay? Uh, and what's really interesting about that is that the Family First Party were on the Liberal Party ticket. Okay, so the Liberal Party were handing out flyers that said, how do I vote? I've got to vote for six parties, Put and they had Family First on that list. And you can see a lot of these Liberal voters took up this idea and put Family First ahead of, well, for example, the One Nation Party. These two parties have been getting very similar levels of support from very similar areas of, sort of you know, people that are voting much the same way. And yet when it comes down to being on the Liberal Party ticket, you know, if One Nation had done a slightly better preference deal with the Liberals, um, you know, I mean, obviously Family First have done that. Uh, well, that, that would have been the difference here because Family First have now just stuck ahead of the One Nation Party. And in fact, they've got, um, well, they've got, oh, the numbers aren't updated yet. So I was going to say they've got, I was going to say they've got mm, 900 votes more than there, but I think they've actually got a, a lot more than that. I think it should be about 10,000 by this point. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you can see now um, now what Family First is ahead of One Nation. So One Nation is, is eliminated, and most of their votes, unsurprisingly, are going to Family First. Now, some of them are heading over to Labour, um, and you can see some of them have headed to the Greens. So the Greens are now 16 votes short of um, getting that getting that 10th uh, spot on the uh, on the ballot. So they're 16 votes short, and the Xenophon party are 500 or so votes short there. So you can see, oh no, no, so I'm actually, my numbers are one below. Oh, that's annoying. Okay, so it looks like at this point, Xenophon and the Greens have both got over that 81,000 um, number, but Xenophon has got over quicker, like got over, um, they've got a slightly higher number than the Greens. So um, Xenophon Kakoshki moore has actually been elected in 10th position. Not that it matters. Sarah Hansen Young has been elected in 11th position. So when the Xenophon preferences are redistributed, most of them are going to the ALP here compared to the Family First. Family First is still ahead, though, by a considerable margin. Also, quite a lot of them are exhausting. Okay, when the Greens preferences are redistributed, there's not too many of them. Um, again, they're going to Labour more than Family First, but Family First actually has more votes here, and that means that Bob, uh, Bob Day has... Uh, well, just about 400, 500 votes more than McEwen from the Labour Party. And so he will be our 12th senator. So there you go. We have three from the Liberal Party, three from the Labour Party, three Nick Xenophon senators, uh, Sarah Hansen Young from the Greens, and Bob Day from the Family First Party. Welcome to your new South Australian Senate. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you have any interest in this data for any reason, um, hit me up and I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, thanks for watching.